motherhood, but not quite as we imagine. Thought-provoking, refreshing, straightforward, sometimes taboo. Often seemingly ordinary, but always honest. Welcome to School for Mothers, opening conversations we all need to have, exploring ways in which you can be fulfilled as a woman, once a mother. Now, here is your host, mother of 10, Danusha Melina Durban. Hello and welcome back to the School for Mothers podcast. I'm Danusha Melina Durban, your host. Let's dive into the episode. Welcome to the School for Mothers podcast, Erica. Oh, I am so looking forward to talking edge with you. Hi, Danusha. What a great name. Oh, thanks, Erica. It's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? But hey, you know. Only three syllables. Yes, it is. It could be so much bigger, couldn't it? Right, it could be. Mm, it could be. Do you know, when I was given this name, my mother and father were talking about what to call me and I was adopted at a year old and they changed my name. So for a whole year, I had another name. And, mm-hmm. and the day after I was one, I was adopted. And uh, so they'd been talking about about what to call me because they didn't like my original name. It wasn't posh enough for them and it didn't... Sorry, mum and dad, but it's true. Um, it wasn't, what, was it, what was it? I keep it really under wraps. Okay. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to push you on that. Thank you. Yeah. I, and, and partly because I have no doubt that there are listeners with that name and it would be unfair. But nevertheless, mm-hmm. they, they had to think about a new name. And so my father in his wisdom said, oh, I know he's Polish. Let's call her Danusha because that was the n- name of my first love. Right. Which wasn't my mother. And so I had the name of the woman that was my actual father's best love, it turns out. He, he, later, he later declared. And that's how I got to have that name. And I think my mother always found that a bit tough. Right. Which is not really surprising. I wouldn't like it. So through your work... One of the things that I, I'm curious about is your engagement with jealousy. With jealousy? Yes, because my mother was fearlessly jealous, ferociously jealous of the fact that actually she had to raise this child with the name of her husband's bestest love. Mm-hmm. A bit much, really. I think that jealousy is a human emotion. And jealousy exists in families, it exists between friends. And denying it is probably more dangerous than acknowledging it and moving on. Yeah. Yeah. It's often it's often this this unspoken piece in female friendships. Uh, rather than being Absolutely right. Yeah, rather than kind of almost unpacking it and putting it on the table and saying, wow, you know what? I'm really pretty jealous that you have you have whatever or you are this. Doesn't it take a lot of the power away from it when we, we own? When we own it, it's true. Yeah. You know, if you have two friends and one is more beautiful or is smarter and acknowledged as such, I mean, those are the things that Elena Ferrante writes about Mm. in her novels. The anonymous Italian writer from Naples, um, she writes about all the things between women we're afraid to talk about. And I think that's why people are drawn to her work. Yeah, I mean, it's those taboos that we all know are there, but we dare not speak about which of course is one of the one of the incredible caches of your work the your ability to to voice the edge to voice the 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 unspokens certainly from you know right back when you first began publishing actually when did you first begin began I can't even uh, think my, tense. my first book of poems was published in 71. Uh-huh. And that was poetry. 
but who reads poetry, right? However, for me, it was the beginning of everything because in poetry, you have to be honest. And it's easy to be honest because you think nobody will ever read it. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> After we stop speaking, I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually in conversation with one of the UK's most famous poets, Holly McNeish. I love it. I absolutely love what absolutely. you're saying. Absolutely. <laughs> Right. And you think, well, nobody will read it, so I can be honest. Uh-uh. Oh, really? Do you think McNeese feels the same way? I'll ask her. Erica, I'm going to ask her. I-, I have no idea if she does. Maybe I she- have no idea either, but yeah. it's rare for poets to be widely, widely read. Some are, and it's amazing, but most are not. Um. Early on, when I published Fear of Flying, people went out and bought my first book of poems as well. I've heard that from some people. And the sales went up. But you can't really judge whether it was actually read or how much it was enjoyed. Those are things that are not, you're not given to know. But sometimes you go out on the road to talk about your books or other things and suddenly someone comes up to you and says my first love and I always quoted these lines to each other and that's always a wonderful thing oh that must be absolutely glorious to have people do that yeah it's quite wonderful Mm. I mean wow I don't know how to really discuss your or even bring your your novels in. Well, they're not novels, are they? Your work in without understating the the sensual turn on of them. Well, the turn on is about speaking what we're su- not supposed to speak, but that we all feel. You know, it's validating the un popular, unspoken feelings. Mm. And I was terrified when I was writing. And I know that the fear indicated that I was writing what I was not supposed to write. And I think through that, I gave people permission to be more honest about their feelings. I hope so. Yeah, I'm sure. What was it like to to be that terrified to write such unspoken taboo pieces that and, and books that that you knew would shake the ground, really? I mean you knew it, didn't you? You you had to. Did. And when people embraced it. And I bless my readers uh, for being brave because there were times that I was denounced, you know, as a bad woman, which is ridiculous, but it hurts. In what ways were you denounced as a bad woman? What led them to? What, did they, what were they pointing at? They were pointing at sex. They were pointing at being honest about negative feelings. Women are supposed to be healers and nice to everybody. And they're not supposed to acknowledge jealousy. They're not supposed to acknowledge sexuality. They're not supposed to acknowledge negativity of any sort. So it's a relief to find a writer who does. And yet you're always sort of a bad girl. What's it like? Being a bad girl, Uh uh, you alternate between uh, misery and exaltation. (laughs) (laughs) Sounds sounds like being a mother, actually. Exactly. (laughs) It's just like being a mother, in fact, but a mother of your books. Yeah. And then there's my daughter, who, of course, loves what I says and say and hates what I say, which is normal for a daughter. Ambivalence. We all have ambivalence. And in in matters of love and family and friendship, we have warring opinions. 
And that is really inevitable, right? Yep. We don't always feel the same thing. And that's very human. So we embrace, I hope that I embrace my own uh, humanity and give people permission to embrace theirs. One of the things that is marks you out is that you are willing to do so as a pioneer. Yeah, so you paved the way, surely. And that's a painful I position. Hope, I, I hope so. There were other women writers who came before me. You know that Doris Lessing in The Golden Notebook wrote about the arguments women have with themselves. And if, if you go back to the 18th century, there were few women who dared to write novels about subjects that were not allowed. But the novel, in fact, became a way of women telling the truth about their lives. Yeah. So let's, let's go back to the, that relationship of ambivalence with Molly. Right. I have this, I have, I'm writing a book at the moment, Erica, it's called Noise, a manifesto mm -hmm. modernizing motherhood. So it has the terrifying quality that you talk about. I'm basically unpacking. Great title, actually. It's a very good title. <laughs> Thank you. That, that means a lot to me. And it's, it's unpacking the pillars of motherhood. It's uh, almost certainly deeply unpopular. Uh, and I have to write it anyway. So that terror of knowing this is not going, this is not what people want to hear and they have to hear it. This you know, motherhood ha has been an area where that has been sort of treacle and mm. sweetness. And of course, it's not always that. No, no, N no, it's not. And uh, the other day I was talking to a publisher, the publisher, and um, about our own children being the foot soldiers of patriarchy. And I was, I must have been in a right. particularly flippant manner because I was being very, you know, uh, uh, you know, emphatic about this. And, and uh, she said, wow, now that's, that's a pretty big statement. And I said, well, it's, it's, I believe it. And that's where I come back to Molly because, because of course we have internalized you know, patriarchy within ourselves, don't we, you know? And then I've been writing about how our own children, if only we knew that our own children will police us, our own children will bring the very, I'll call shackles for the sec, I can't find, think of another word, but... Well, you know, they're more radical than we are. Yes. Um, we, have, we have taught them that it's okay to express negative feelings and they do and they are they are maybe understand that in love there are positive feelings and negative feelings but when our own children say them against us we don't like it well that's it so it's one thing uh, raising spirited you know expressive children and then they become spirited expressive teenagers and then exactly. they bring it they they reverse it back onto us. Exactly. And that's an experience and a half. And because I've got, I think I've maybe raised, I'm in the process of raising several more teenagers, but I, I think I'll, I've done, I've, I can't even remember, seven. So, I, I, you know, I have some history with teenagers, <laughs> let's just say, some experience, you know, of of genders uh, so it's not just all boy or girl or whatever um non-binary i have, I have some experience so and, and i've got lot there's lots and lots of their friends and watching this right annihilation yeah. of the very person that you know was your often often not always but their main carer right exactly and, wow that's something to go through and to weather and to find identity with and through. And I, I, so that's why I was saying this, this, and, and you're reminding me as you talk about ambivalence, like on the one hand, you know, great pride. That's but why we have all these sweet little lines about motherhood, because we're trying to reverse the normal double barreled response. The double, it's normal when you're little 
to adore, adore, adore your parent. And it's normal when you're a teenager to break away. Mm-hmm. And, and then when you have children of your own, you realize that you were unfair. That whole thing is, is very clear to me. Yes, the individuation is so important. And, exactly. And also a, within that individuation, a, 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 an unpicking of the parental uh, input, what, whatever that is, you know, whatever it is, to, to hit up against it. And particularly if you're on the edge, if you're writing, you know, thought leadership, if you're writing uh, erotic writing, if, you're, if you actually, if you have a voice, <laughs> it could be anything. Exactly. But to be frank, it could be anything, couldn't it? If if you were writing about vegetarianism, then I imagine that the child might sit there eating a juicy steak. <laughs> right. I had a very interesting confession from a young nephew. And he said, I used to go into your office in the country and see all the erotic illustrations, Japanese erotic illustrations that were hanging on your wall. And he said, it made me think that sex was okay, that sexual feelings were okay, and I didn't have to punish myself. Hmm. Well, how wonderful. That is sort of amazing, right? Oh, that's I mean, fantastic. And they were ancient Japanese scroll paintings of sexuality. But he found them, it was okay to be sexual, to have sexual feelings, because throughout history, people have had them. Well, it's human, isn't it? I mean... It's human. Why right. are we trying to bury something that's human? Well, both elevate Well, that's it, exactly um, my question, too. Yeah, I mean, both elevate it. people are embarrassed... It of their sexual feelings. And I understand that too. Hmm. So in in pieces about yourself and Molly, your daughter, you come across as, or at least the writing about you, and that's, I think that's the thing, is it almost like you're paying prude cop and sexual cop? <laughs> right. <laughs> I know. think that's a good description. Oh, is it? Oh, okay. Because yeah. I, I didn't know if it was the actual writers, you know, the journalists, or whether in fact, because it's a great story, isn't it? So, you know, we'll run with that one. It's, or... it's hard. It's really hard to know, right? Yes, um, exactly. It's really hard to know. Yeah. And my, my daughter also does her own writing. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, but I've always taught her that it was okay to express who you are. Well, even when that's not uh, not in favor of you? Yeah. What do you, I mean, I was critical of my mother. Was I not? Of course. Yes. And kids become critical in order to grow up and find their own identity. And we shouldn't punish them for that because it proves we were good parents that we gave them free expression. Painful though it is, you know. Mm. And what, what age do you, f- what do you think in, in experience and also observation? When do you think children come to this kind of, uh, I don't know, is it a return ship or a, can it, does it have to be when they have their own children? Because so many women aren't having children. Will they get there? <laughs> well, it doesn't have to be when they have their own children. It has to be, but it tends to happen when they become much more confident of their own identity, however that evolves. Yes. And when they're confident that they are not part of you and that they have their own opinions, you know, I remember when I was a kid, I thought my mother's opinions were golden. Then I went to university and I came home and disagreed with her about everything. (laughs) And, you know, that's that's what kids do. And that proves that you've raised a kid who's ready to be independent, moving towards independence, which is what you want. Exactly. Even if it's painful, you know, 
it can be painful, but it proves you've raised an independent kid. Mm, completely, completely. What's it like having zipless fucks? Well, I never liked zipless fucks. Zipless fucks were not of interest to me. All my relationships have been very mutual and caring. But it was an idea rather than something that I did. Mm. It was like an anti-self. Yes, yeah. Whereas actually... What would it be like to not be emotional? What would it be like to be able to fuck anybody? I never could do it, but I could fantasize about it. But we are led to believe that it is possible. I don't mean through your work. I actually mean um, since your work, your earlier work, that that it's become much more embraced as a a proposition for and, and, and an actuality for women to go take be hungry desirous you know you right. have you have this uh, libido you go fuck who the hell you like you get up out of that bed you walk you you know there's this there's that sense that it's possible yet actually you know we're still grappling with whether it is truly Something that Satisfying. leaves, yeah. Does it leave us feeling True. nourished as a soul? Right. <laughs> exactly. That you describe it absolutely perfectly. Yeah. And it's it's our ambivalence that we want something that when we do it, perhaps is not satisfying. But that's human nature, right? Uh huh. I mean, there are people who have to climb Mount Everest and go to the top and die, but they, they must try. And I think sexually people can be like that. Not everybody. Some people want warm and cuddly and some people (laughs) want. (laughs) I just got to laugh. That's so cute that you said warm and cuddly. Sorry, listeners. If you like warm and cuddly. Some people want warm and cuddly and some people want adventure and madness yeah and chaos and sweat and like oh that's and I, you know yeah that's one version is whatever is your your uh, need you're trying to learn who you are yes and i have to admit i've always preferred long, warm and cuddly Oh, Erica. Uh, Whatever my heroine, my heroines may be my opposite. Oh, I love you. (laughs) Heroines can be your opposite, not your mirror image. (laughs) The teenager in me is going, no, please don't tell me that. This is hilarious. I love that you said that. Okay. Tell me about warm and cuddly sex. What, What is warm and cuddly sex? Uh, warm and cuddly sex is somebody who adores you Mm. and wants to pleasure you instead of just taking his own pleasure or her own pleasure. It's a a person who cares for you. Is that weird? No, not, not at all. Not at all. (laughs) No, no, no. And I'm somebody that uh, created a, a, a quadrant of lovers, a quadrant of potential lovers for my dating propositions. And mm-hmm. I, I made this quadrant because I wanted to be, you know, I'm, I'm an ex-academic. I had to kind of find a model that might fit, like, so that I could be opposite, opposite anybody um, having a cup of tea, whatever. And I would be able to find out what he would be like. In this case, it was men. And find out what he would be like in bed. Right. Yeah, without sleeping with him, without fucking. And so obviously I had to actually trial this. So it's totally obvious that in order to prove my model, my quadrant, I needed to go fuck those men to do it. Yeah, so I just got to get that out of the way, okay? So I had... Were you right about each... Erica, completely. 
You like, were so right. It's in the language. It's in the t- it's in the language that men use. It's in the right. it's, it's in the the way they are with you. But mainly, it's embedded in the language of a man. So the quadrant is cock hog. I never thought I'd be, we'd be talking about this, but just, is this okay to quickly tell you this? Of course. So cock hog, pussy connoisseur, indifferent and malleable. Now, we're all though, you know, we have the potential. It's not just a man that is that, it's a woman as well. So Right. First pussy job, connoisseur. Yeah, pussy connoisseur is about the pleasure of others. Yeah. Right. So and if you're a woman pussy connoisseur, then you'll be wanting to pleasure your partner. Yeah. So it's not right. Yeah. And if you're a man, you'll be wanting to pleasure a partner. That that your satisfaction is in seeing them. In ecstasy, Under- yeah, right, satisfied, exactly. adored. You want to l- layer on that that level of just love and care, and and it's about the the attention on them. A cock hog is, I want it on me. It's like I, right. whether you're a male or a female, it's it. You know, it doesn't matter. So it's it's about you. It's like I can't wait. It's all about me. It's not about the actual penis involved but it may be right the indifferent is like i could probably have a cup of tea rather than bother (laughs) yeah like you know what i've got running to do or i've like i love my i love my stamp collecting or i love cooking i love in fact it's just not sexuality to them it's like it just is something it's a function it's like just got to get that off your chest like just dirty water off your chest it's like come on get on that is a perfect description (laughs) And then the malleable, the malleables, no matter again which gender um, or genders, the malleables are like they depend on the context of being in relationship with the other person. Now, so if they're in relationship with a cock hog, they'll make it all about that cock hog. Right. Yeah. Or if exactly. they're with a pussy connoisseur, they'll be like, oh, okay, you want to pleasure me? Cool. Or if they're with an indifferent, like, all right, okay, so we'll both go running. <laughs> Right. It's like, yeah, I exactly. love stamps. I love them. They are now my life. <laughs> so that's I, great. I, you first have to understand which one you are, and then when you're with somebody, like, okay. So when I get a text from a guy saying, "I cannot wait to give you what I've got," like, or, or I cannot wait to see the pleasure on your face when I do X. Yeah. I'll right. know I'll know where he not just the one off, but he'll do it through all sorts of ways, not sexual ways, all sorts of ways that are about other people. When it's a cock hog, it's definitely like um, I've got something in my pants that needs to explode. I Right. Because they're they're looking at them. They're looking it's downwards. A very, very good description, I think. <laughs> it's <laughs> It's, it helped me once I got through my research stage, which was a little bit of extensive, I have to say. Um, I then could sit opposite somebody and go, Do you know what? We're just not going to, we're just not going to gel. And so I tried it explicitly with this. I mean, I tried it with lots of guys, but I, this particular one, I was like, I want to teach you about my model. And he said, Oh, I know exactly where I, I know I'm, I, I'm a pussy connoisseur. I mean, like Danusha, I am, I, I'm all about pleasure. So I said, All right. Okay, okay. He said, well, you know, you should see it with me. <laughs> That's oh, great. Okay, then. All right, if you insist. But sometimes people don't want to say it in words. They want to say it in deeds. <laughs> oh, yes, indeed, they do, don't they? <laughs> and, so, and, and I told him where I thought he sat, and he, and, and he was undeniably cock-hoggish. Undeniably. Mm-hmm. And it was. And sometimes they lie about who they are. Yeah, well, because we pick up, don't we? What is going to get us what we want? And so there's right. a narrative that actually can be spieled out. Unconscious, mm-hmm. unconscious. Yes. Yeah, and and I saved myself such a, you know such a lot of unsatisfying experiences by mm-hmm. working working that out because I just didn't and don't want to have to go through quantity. I don't want to. I consider myself 
more precious than that. And I don't mean in a kind of princessy way. I just mean, I just haven't got the time for lots of, you know, soul space for lots of... Right. Ne- negative. Negative um, experience. experience. And yes, so I exactly. need to cut through that and find a way of finding out. It also allowed me to see and understand my experience with my ex-husband, hope he's not listening, who's an indifferent. And, right. and actually... If I'd worked that out earlier, I would have seen an incompatibility. Right. You know, I'm... Well, this is, this is fascinating. I mean, (laughs) your, your exploration is quite fascinating. And I think everybody's got to do that on their own with themselves and say, what, what do I really like? What really makes me feel cared for? Oh, completely. What what, is, what what turns me on, but not in a kind of activity sense, but, uh, you know, well, I, I, it's, a lo- it's a locus of kind of analysis for me. It's kind of, where am I looking? Am I looking at myself and my pleasure? Or am I looking right. out there? What brings me that turn on? It's, it's, it is, is it other? Is it me? Am I kind of, it's, there's no problem in, in, accepting like, you know, at this point in my life, it just isn't really a big deal for me. There's nothing wrong in that. Or in fact, there are lots of people that that's the way it is all their life. And we live in right. such a sexualized uh, society that, that that can be problematized, can't it? It's like, oh, you've got to all be wanting wild, passionate. Actually, if you look at most kind of Netflixy things at the moment, I've noticed a version of sex and it's you just get in the door you just get in the door wherever you live. You only just get in the door. He shoves you up against a wall. You rip each other's clothes off. You have really uncomfortable sex. Right. On a really, in weird, not weird, I don't mean weird, but kind of, I mean uncomfortable. Like I'm thinking literally physically uncomfortable on a sofa side, which really would be quite, <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. And, and I'm thinking of all the practicalities as I'm watching it and I'm thinking, why are they portraying sex, normalizing sex in this one manner? It's always in a particular way at the moment. Right, exactly. And it goes through trends Yes. in, in society, you know, and novels often portray those trends and movies also portray those trends and they change over time. So... That is very interesting because it gives you an idea of the society that you had. Yeah. I'm I won- think that, that it's really fascinating. Well, I'm wondering when we'll have a trend for a kind of half-hearted shuffle over to say, oh, could you just, you know, like <laughs> a, a, a really... <laughs> just- I don't think that <laughs> it's stimulating. But for satire, it works very well. Yes. Well, that, that's the issue, though, that we, we don't get a real kind of what we said at, at the beginning, which is kind of a, a raw validating the unspoken, which is what some of the unspoken is, that it's not wild, that it's not always, you know, this rip-roaring, bodice-ripping. I mean, we could talk for so long about this and I'm deeply grateful and I'm so honoured that you come on and talk sex, talk life, talk ambivalence. That's the most important thing, you know. I want to give you a huge virtual hug. You're epic. I want to give you one too. Thank you. Thank you for this. If you enjoyed this episode, and I really hope you did, I'd love to hear from you. You can leave a rating and a review over on Apple Podcasts, or email me on hello at schoolformothers.com. That's hello at schoolformothers.com. What part of this episode, for instance, struck a chord with you? I'd love to hear from you. Well, that's all for now, listeners. Thanks so much for tuning in. Have a fantastic week. And of course, stay safe. Sending you lots of love. Thank you for tuning in to the School for Mothers podcast. To continue the conversation and keep your dose of inspiration up, head over to schoolformothers.com forward slash podcast, where you'll find bonus content from Danusha and her guests on habits, recommendations, books, 
best apps, time-saving secrets, life hacks, health, sleep and anything in between. That's scoreformothers.com forward slash podcast. 